Okay. Here's the kind of the map of chapter four, how we're working our way through it. Today is section 4.4, multiplication rule. On Friday, we looked at the or, the inclusive or, and how to calculate probabilities when we had statements that involved that. And we started off with really the basics, the concepts of how to calculate probability. We talked about the frequency rule. We talked about classical approach. One of the challenges, I think, in this material is it's so easy to forget where you are. We have so many different situations. And you have to be alert to what's my situation. That uh, clues you into what the technique is. The math here is, tends to be very easy. What's challenging is to know which of the equations, which of the techniques to use. And here's an overview of what we've done so far. In the big picture. We started out and we defined a simple event and a simple trial. I rolled the dice once, I flipped the coin once, I observed one birth, I picked a, one cadet, and we're calculating those kind of probabilities. On section 4.3, we're still working with a single event. I'm doing one procedure. But then the, the event itself was compound. We looked at an and and an or. So what's the probability if I select one cadet that that cadet will, will be female and the legacy? That's a compound event. One trial. One trial, one cadet. What's the probability if I select a single cadet, one trial, that cadet will be female or a legacy? We'll use inclusive one. So right there already we've got three different situations you need to be alert to because we calculate probabilities a little bit differently. Well, today we're going to look at yet another situation where I have multiple trials, but we're back to simple events, and that's going to lead us to the multiplication rule. And here's just an overview. I'm going to be using the example throughout today to get us started. A nice, simple, visual example, one you can keep in your mind. We're going to be working with four aces of the deck of cards both describe what we've done and to motivate the new probability rule we're introducing today, which is the product. So in 4.2, a single trial, simple event, that's like asking a question, if I draw one card, is it a black, is it a black card out of my four aces? That's how we started out our first baby step. Then we looked at a single trial of compound event. So now I'm drawing, still drawing one card, but I'm asking, is it a black ace? Is it black and an ace? Or is it black or a spade? What are those probabilities? So I introduced on a single trial an and and an or to get a compound event. Now today, I'm going to change the question, and I'm going to talk about drawing more than one card. I'm going to draw a second card. And I'm going to ask the probability, well, what is the probability of drawing the first card and it's black, and then getting, drawing a second card, and the probability of it also being black, for example. Okay? And you sense that distinction. It's really important. Know what your situation is, and then the probability is usually pretty easy to calculate. Now, I've got to do a little bit of notation. In the book, unfortunately and somewhat confusingly, the author uses and to mean two different things. And I know I get confused, but I have to stop and think. So from here on out in the class, in my notes, in any of the quizzes or tests, I, I'll use the following notation so it's obvious to you. If I'm talking about and in the sense it's a single trial and both A and B are occurring, now this is the sense of and we've used already. I select a single cadet. That cadet is female and a legacy. That and, I'll use the symbol an upside down view or the intersection. 
Now today we're going to introduce a slightly different meaning of and. I won't use a different symbol for it. I'll just use P of A and B. But now it's going to mean the following. I'm, <coughs> I'm going to have two trials for my procedure. And I'm interested in the probability of getting A on the first trial and B on the second. When I write it that way, you know I'm talking about two trials. When I write it this way, you know I'm talking about a single trial. A little bit more about notation, and then we'll get into doing some examples. P of B given A, that vertical line, if you see this, you would read it as the probability of B given A. And it means what's the probability that the event B is going to happen, given that A has already happened. <coughs> So there's a time sequence in here you can think of. I've got some information. I know that A occurred. And having now knowing that A's already occurred, what's the probability of B happening? So it's a second trial. Let's practice some conditional probabilities. Well, first I'll introduce the multiplication rule. Then we'll practice some conditional probabilities and actually work our way through and derive this rule. That's the multiplication rule. It'll be on your formula sheet. You'll be using it a lot. And now you know what all the symbols mean. So that's P of A and B. And when I write it that way, it's A on the first trial, B on the second. And when you see P of B given A, it means the probability of B on the second trial given that A is already occurred. All right, let's get to our example for ACEs. And our procedure is I'm going to draw two cars without replacement. There's a reason I put that in red. It's really important without replacement. Later on, we're going to look at what would happen if I replace the car event. We're going to see it's really critical to understand in the sampling technique whether I'm replacing or not. It changes how we calculate probabilities. And what I'm going to be interested in is event A is the first card is black, and event B is the second card is blue. So I want to know my notation probability of P of A and B. Okay, so let's work through this. It's a simple example so you can see it and you can keep it in your head. Well, if I ask you in one trial what's the probability of event A, and event A is the card's black, that's pretty, that's just good old frequency method or classical rule. Uh, classical rule in this case because all outcomes are equally likely. Remember, that's one of the requirements before I can use a classical rule. But if you assume it's a shuffled deck of four cards, and I'm picking one at random, and all outcomes are equally likely, so the probability of picking a black card is two out of four or a half. All right, well, nothing new there. Now let's go through and see if we can work out what's the probability of that second card being black. Well, we're going to take two cases. Let's suppose the first time I draw a black ace. Remember, I I'm not sticking it back, so it's gone. This is without replacing my deck. My hand might look something like this. <coughs> now, what's the probability of B? That next card being black. Well, pretty obvious, isn't it? One out of three. One black card left. But what if the first card I drew was red? Now what's the probability of the second card being black? Two out of three. So for the answer to the question, what's the probability that the second card is black, I've got two answers. Which is right? Well, the answer is it depends. That's why we have this concept of a conditional probability. 
it depends on what happened previously. And that's this the, the rationale for this notation that I introduced earlier, the conditional notation, the probability of B given A. Now this can, can be confusing at time. When you see this, re remember that the first letter, the first event, is the one you're interested in. That's the one whose probability you want to know. And the event to the right of the vertical line is the event that's already happened. So think of it this way, I have information now. I know what happened. And if I know what happened, now can I calculate the probability of event B? How would I calculate it? So let's practice calculating conditional probabilities. There are four bases. What's the probability of a red ace given a black ace? I'll go down to the second row here. Cadet Lombardi? Red ace. So, would you replace the cards? No, we're not replacing cards. All right, so it's going to be 1, 3, 3, 3, 5. After I pick the black ace, there are three cards left. Yeah. And how oh, many of them are red? Oh, uh, so it's going to be 0. 0.66. Two out of three. Yeah. Everybody see that? Do this in your mind. This is a simple case. We should be able to do it in the minds, hopefully. What's the second conditional probability? That Griffin probability of picking an ace of hearts, <coughs> given that I've picked an ace of diamonds. Um, one out of three. <coughs> All right. Traco, the third conditional probability. Zero. Zero. If I've already picked the ace of hearts, there's no chance I'm going to pick it again because I'm not replacing it. And last, then died it? Uh, one out of three. One out of three. Any questions on that? Got the feel of conditional probabilities. These nice, simple examples. So let's put it all together then. And let's look at this multiplication <coughs> rule in action. The probability of A and B is equal to, this is the equation, the probability of A times the probability of B given A. So now let's work these out. What's, if A is a black ace and B is the event red ace, what's the probability of A and B? <coughs> who's, who's next? Oh, you are. Would it be point five? Let's take it piece by piece. What's the probability of A? A is point five. Point five. In the first draw, it's uh, point five, or whatever the right is, a fraction. One out of two. Now, given that I've, uh, now what's the probability of B given A? <coughs> one. If you don't replace it, it be one. We're not replacing it, not yet. Okay, so um, one. How many cards are left after I draw the, the black ace? Oh, this is one. Okay. Um, then <coughs> two out of three. Right. Because the two red aces are left, and I've picked one of the black ones. So I multiply those together, and I get two out of six, or one third. <coughs> <coughs> That's that probability. Mm -hmm. So for P of B given A, mm -hmm. the A is just to say that you've already completed that step. It's not supposed to. It's just not hurting that fraction at all. Not hurting the fraction. Yeah, A has already occurred. All right. That's knowledge you already have. So in this case, what we already know is that we have a black ace. Right. So you cover up one of these. Now, given that information, What's the probability when I draw it now, I'll get a red ace? We, we did these conditional probabilities in the previous slide. Now we're putting them all together to get the probability on the left, P of A and B, using the product. All right, let's do, uh, let's do the last one there. 
Uh, Cadet Hamilton, take me to the thinking, please. Uh, one out of four and one out of four. Okay, probability of A and ace of spade on the first draw, that's obviously one out of four. One out of four match. Now that I draw the ace of spade, what's the probability I get the ace of club? One out of three. One out of three. All right, making sense? Okay, we'll take it up a few notches by the end of class. Those are the answers. Now let's change the procedure. Let's rethink the problem, and now I'm going to replace cards. What we just did was an experiment that's called sampling without replacement. And now we're going to think through the same problem, sampling with replacement. So I draw a card, I look at it, and then I put it back, shuffle. Well now, what would be the probability that I get a second card that's black, given the first card was black? It, it doesn't change, does it? And you see that? I started out with four cards. I pick one, I look at it. Oh, it's black. Then I put it back again. What's the probability, assuming they're shuffled up and it's a random selection, that when I pick again, it will be black? What has it changed? In other words, P of B does not <coughs> depend on A. In this case, the events are independent. Can it be two out four? Uh, it would be two out of four, you're right. Thank you. I think I caught this this morning and I didn't forgot to correctly guess. Two out of four. Probably black is two out of four. So independent is this con is an important concept here. Recall when we were looking at the addition rule, the important concept was disjoint or mutually exclusive. Can they occur at the same time? Now, in looking at the multiplication rule, the important concept is, are they independent? Or, I mean, conversely, are they equal? <laughs> the events. So the formal definition now, two events, A and B, are independent. If the occurrence of one does not affect the, the probability of the occurrence of the other. And in that case, P of B given A is just P of B. And I hope that those symbols make sense to you, because if we're saying the probability of B doesn't depend on A, then this conditional probability is just the same as the original probability. It makes no difference. They are independent. When you do sampling with replacement, you will have independent events. When you do sampling without replacement, you'll have dependent events. Here's some examples of independent events. Most of what we've talked about so far has been independent. You're flipping coins. Even if you had five heads in a row, now we're assuming it's a fair coin. Even if you've got five heads in a row, what's the probability of the next clip that put you ahead? Well, half, right? You might feel in your gut, oh, it's got to be a, it's got to be a head again, or maybe you'll feel the opposite. I'm due for a tail. If it's a fair coin, the probability of the next toss is not influenced by the previous tosses. Those events are independent. Doesn't matter. Like rolling a dice, or roulette wheel, or predicting the gender of a child. Independent events. Today, when we looked at the situation of sampling without replacement. Then we create dependencies. And yes, sampling without replacement always creates dependent events. All right, let's take it up a little notch here and look at a different problem and calculate the probability. That's my data set. Set of observations. And I want to look at a probability of A and B 
where A is in the first person I select is positive, they test positive, and the second was negative. Now think about this situation. Let's analyze it before we jump in and start doing calculations. Which probability calculation technique should we use? Yes? Uh, the dependent. They are going to be dependent events, aren't they? Because I'm without replacing them. <coughs> taking a person out, observing them, I'm taking another. So it's going to be dependent. Are all the outcomes equally likely? Well, if I pick them at random, they are. Even though there's a difference in time. Yes, each, each time I conduct a my trial, all outcomes are equally like if I if I'm not replacing, I'll have a number a different number of outcomes, but they all should still be equally like Right? So now let's calculate this. Our product rule says it's P of A times P of B given A. <coughs> Alright, and A is the probability of first time selecting someone tested positive. So what's that going to do? I can use my classical approach, can I? Because at this time, all outcomes are equally likely. And using the classical approach, what's the probability going to be? 44 out of 50. 44 out of 50. Now I've selected a person, and I've selected a person who tested positive. So what's the probability of picking the next person and they would be someone who tested negative. Is it Arnold? Got from 50 people and I pick one. And I'm telling you that one tested positive. Now I'm asking you what's the probability that the next one I pick will test negative? Yeah, there's six, there's 49 people left because I didn't replace. How many of those tested negative? Well, six because the first one I selected tested positive. So this product is the answer to the probability. That's what it is. A little bit different now. You can't do it in your head, can you? With the four cards. But the formula is the same. It works. All right, let's do another one. <clears throat> What's the probability if we pick two people and random them out of this class that they'll have a birthday on the same day of the week? Do you remember the day of the week you're born on? I don't imagine you remember that day, but someone has told you you were born on a? All right, I'm going to randomly pick two cadets and say, I. That Paul's the first one. What's that probability? Well, it's any day of the week, right? I didn't say Monday through Sunday. It's any day of the week. So I can't go wrong with the first selection, can I? So when I select him, it's seven out of seven. I don't care which day of the week he's born on. But now when I select Sanford Crane, what day we report on? No idea? We'll say Thursday. What's the probability he was born on Thursday? Yeah, one out of seven. We're making a bit of an assumption there that actually we'll see there's a problem in 106 that it's not equally likely that all, uh, all days of the week are equally likely. Turns out weekends are not nearly as likely. We'll study that in 106. But for now, we'll assume they are. So that's one out of seven. Now let's change the problem a little bit. Before I said any day of the week. Now I'm going to say my favorite day, Thursday. So now what's the probability that I'll select two cadets who were both born on Thursday? 
And Arnold, when are you born? What day do we have? Uh, Don't know? All right, you got to send some emails to your moms tonight to get this information. She'll remember. I know she will. Well, now, what's the probability that he's born on Thursday? Born on a 7. When I ask a student when he wakes up, what day of the week he was born on, what's the probability it will be Thursday? Is it dependent on his birthday? No. So it's 1 over 7 times 1 over 7 or 1 over 49. Those are independent events. All right, let's work some more problems. <coughs> We're going to stick with cards for a minute. And I've learned I can't always assume that everyone is familiar with the card deck. That's, that's fine, but you're going to need to become familiar. This is such an easy example to use. The card deck, we have uh, a standard deck of cards, no jokers. We have 52 cards. And we have four suits of 13. And we have the spades and the clubs. And they always have their designs in black. And we have the hearts and the diamonds. They always have their designs and numbers in red. And now that's all we need to know. Let's calculate some probabilities. And in these next sequence of problems, I've interspersed problems from each of the sections we've worked on. So you're going to have to identify which type of problem first before you decide which technique to use. All right, let me go back to the third row. Single card is randomly selected. What's the probability that the card is a five? Right, Sig? Um, four out of 52. Probability of five. Now, we, before we dive into the pool here, let's just think about our problem. Are all outcomes equally likely? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, randomly selected from the deck. Uh, so I can use my classical approach, P of E equals S over N. So the probability of a 5 is S over N. He did all this in his head, but we're going to do it out longhand for lots to, to instill this practice in you. There's 52 different outcomes, and four of those correspond to number is five, one for each suit. All right? So that's an easy one. Now, what's the probability of still drawing a single card, but it's a club or a four? Okay? Barasco, what's my situation? What technique do I have to use here? Um, the inclusive or? It's an inclusive or, so it's going to be the addition rule, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Satisfies the condition of the addition rule. <coughs> Let me write that down for you. P of A or B equals P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B. Use our so let's go through it. What's P of A? 13 out of 52. Yeah, probability of a club, 13 out of 52. P of B? 4 out of 52. 4 out of 52. A and B? 1 out of 52. 1 out of 52. I guess that would be 16 out of 52. Okay. Anybody on board? Two cards drawn without replacement. All right, Cadet Russell, analyze the situation for me and, and tell me what we've got. Well, it's the without replacement. But you, the first <coughs> is an ace, it's um, 4 out of 52. So it's, 
So we've got a replacement. So are these events going to be independent or dependent? Dependent. Um, dependent. De dependent. dependent. So which which rule am I going to use? Um, the the rule product why don't we just went over it because there's two trials and a probability of a uh, what you say the first card is an ace and the second card is an ace so our formula is this okay when I draw the first card what's the probability it will be an ace four out of fifty two <coughs> I've got that ace in my hand. I'm going to draw it again. Three out of fifty-one. Three out of fifty-one. Good. Okay. Good, Dylan. What's the situation? What rule do I have to use here? Product rule. Product rule, because I've got two trials. Are these events dependent or independent? Uh, dependent. Dependent because? There's no replacement. No replacement. Good. So I've got P of A and B. Product rule says it's P of A times P of B given A. So what would be P of A? First card is A of spades. One out of fifty-two. One out of fifty-two. Card in my hand, the one I drew, it's the eight of spades. Right, so How many cards left? We're down one spade. And one card. So how many cards are left? Um, 51. That's my sample space now. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so it'll be 12. Yeah, there you go. Good. <laughs> Most challenging one. How appropriate for a section marcher here? Do what? You, to solve it, well, you can solve this one of several ways. But if you recall back early on, I gave you a simple little formula. I said this is trivial algebra, but you're going to like this formula because it'll come in handy. Now, here's a case where it comes in handy. The probability of getting at least one diamond. I draw two cards. Analyze that situation. Are you drawing two on the first? Draw your card, I'm drawing another card, not putting any back. Two out of fifty two. Two out of fifty two? At least one diamond. At least one. Five. Okay. It, it, often it's times, if it's not real obvious, step back and, and draw some pictures. What could it possibly be? The first time I could pick, I could get a diamond. Uh, and then the second card, it could be a diamond. And that would be at least one diamond. I could pick a diamond and a not diamond. That would be at least one diamond. I could pick a not diamond and a diamond. That would be at least one. But then I have this event. I pick two cards that are not diamonds. So from here, you've got two ways to go. I could calculate those three probabilities. And you know how to do that. Does someone see the shortcut? Uh, well, OK, but. If I'm talking about the probability of at least one diamond. I'm sorry, the probability that it's not, that it's both not a diamond. There you go. Who said that? It's the 
complement of that event. So the probability of at least one diamond, if I call that the event E, and I look at its complement, and its complement is no diamonds, when I add those two together, it has to equal one, doesn't it? It's that simple little formula I, I told you that I think the first day I said, remember this, it's going to come in handy. Now, why do I think that's so great in this case? Well, if I can't do one calculation now, then I'm, I've almost got my answer. And I claim it's easy to calculate this. So I'll call this P of E bar. It's the event, no diamonds. And what is that? Chaco, go ahead. What's on the first card? What's the probability of not a diamond? So, fifty-two minus thirteen. Mm -hmm. That's pretty close to thirty-nine out of fifty-two. Mm, thirty-eight out of fifty-one. <coughs> yes. That's the probability of my complement. So what's the probability that I'm interested in? At least one diamond? E of E equals one minus that. I'm not bothering to do the calculations on HPA or TIs. I know you can do that. I think it's easier to see the logic if I leave them as fractions. So let's just stick with fractions. Okay, that was the first example. You'll see more times when you can use that complement rule and make, make your life a lot easier. Don't forget it. It's your friend. <coughs> we have a product rule. So far, we've just looked at two events. I drew one card, then I drew a second. Well, what if I draw three cards? Do I need another rule? Or if I drew 15 cards? Or I flip the coin seven times? Actually, the product rule has this nice natural extension of itself. Now, let me talk you through it. The probability, let's look at the probability of tossing a coin three times and getting all heads. If I'm tossing a coin and I'm observing heads, what can you tell me about these events? Important property, right? independent. Right? That's nice. I don't have to worry about conditional probabilities. I'm interested in probability of a heads and a heads and a heads. Uh, but the product rule only talks about two events. Well, that's okay. I'll lump those two together and call them a single event, a head and a head. So now I have something that's in the form of the product rule. There's an event, and it's followed by another event. You see, nothing up my sleeve, just conceptualizing the problem a little bit differently. And since they're independent, it's the probability of these two happening together times the probability of that one. And when you do the calculations, it's just one half times one half times one half is probably what you would have guessed to begin with. But there's the firm demonstration of using the, the product rule, one out of eight. So the important idea here is we can look at just more than two events in sequence. We can look at any number, and what you're really doing under the covers is extending the product rule. Now, how could this come in handy? Here's a, gone all the way from looking at four aces to something more complicated. Uh, let's suppose you're an engineer working for Boeing and you have to find out, you need a reliability rate of 0.999. Actually, if I'm flying in a plane, I hope it's at least that reliable more. And one way you can achieve that reliability is by having redundant parts. So the question is, how many redundant parts do I need? get a reliability rate of 0.999. I don't want to put in hundreds of them if I don't need them, but I want to make sure I have enough in there. And what we'll assume now that the failure rate is 
So that's the probability that at any given time that part would fail. So we have two events, uh, F and S, a fail and a success. And I know the probability of failure is 0.05. So what's the probability of a success? They're complements, right? So it's 0.95. Now if I just had one in one of these parts, how reliable is my system? Well, the probability of success is just 0.95. That's not where I need to be. What if I put two of the parts together in such a way that if one failed, the other would come online and start working? So how could I have failure in this case if I have two parts, a redundant one? Well, I, I don't have failure if they both failed. So that's the probability of an F and an F. And I'm going to make a little bit of assumption here. And I'm going to say these events are independent. We're going to say the property. One part failing doesn't change the probability that the next part will fail. That might not be true in the world. So the probability of both of those failing at the same time is 0 0.0025. So what's the probability that this plane is going to crash? It's the complement of that. Or 1 minus 0 0.0025, and that's 0 0.9975. So I have one redundant part. I've upped my reliability, but I'm not where I want to be yet. So let's put in another one. If there are three redundant parts, the probability of failure is, well, all three would have to fail at the same time. That's a pretty small probability, which means the complement the probability of success is 0.999875. Using the product rule, a little bit of probability to do some engineering on how many redundant parts I need to get a desired reliability. This probability is really used out in the real world where people don't play cards and toss dice. It really has applications out there. Okay, we have time for one more topic here. After I said that sampling without replacement always gives you dependent events, there are times, however, in situations where <coughs> really just out of convenience, we say, never mind. And we treat the events as independent. But we only do that in certain situations. That's when our sample size is small relative to the population. Generally, it's called a 5% rule or guideline. If your sample size is 5% or less than 5% of the overall population, then you can assume that the events are independent out of convenience. And actually, with calculators and computers now, I'm not sure that this is ever really necessary, but let's take an example and I'll show you what we mean. Suppose there's 1,500 cadets in the Corps and 450 are from Virginia. What's the probability of picking three from Virginia? Well, that's an example, if I'm very precise, that's sampling without replacement. Pick three at random. What's the probability all three would be from Virginia? And that would be one third, or excuse me, the first one would be one out of three. But then I have 1,499 left, and 449 of them are not from Virginia. Then I have 1,498 left, and 448 of them are from Virginia. Before the days of calculators, in fact, when I took statistics, doing this with a slide rule would not have been fun. It's not a big burden to you calculators, but that is 0 0.03. In 
if I use the 5% rule to simplify it, and I say, man, I'm only taking 3 out of 1,500. That's well less than 5%. So I'm going to assume for convenience that they're independent. What would I get? Well, I'd get 1 third times 1 third times 1 third, 0.037. I'm only off in the third decimal place. So that's the rationale for this 5%. All right, that's a wrap for today. That's a lot of material. I'll see you Wednesday.